Our family is a Dr. Pepper family. We uh, love the taste of Dr. Pepper. It goes back to when my grandfather used to sell the old glass bottles of Dr. Pepper on his rounds in Texas. And so since then, our family has been big Dr. Pepper drinkers. Now, as you know, Dr. Pepper has a history of when you pop that top, it's bound to spew. And so you've got to watch it. That pressure builds and builds. And on too many occasions, we have been blessed with the eruption of Dr. Pepper all over us. That pressure gets to the point where it just explodes. And you know, I think that's a good visual example of what is happening right now in our society. People feel like pressure is building. They feel that just when things get settled, suddenly um, everything is shaken up again. And what's going to happen? Not only what's going to happen in our nation, in our cities, what's happening internally. And they feel this pressure building to the point of explosion if that hasn't already happened. We saw it this week in our country. We saw the pressure building in people to the point of there was an explosion. Unfortunately, it caused harm. Frustration happens in all of our lives. Those emotions erupt because things don't go as expected. And that's what frustration really is. Frustration is when I believe uh, something is going to play out in a certain way and it doesn't. I have this um, expectation in my mind, a plan, and then it doesn't go as I thought it was, and then I'm annoyed or I'm upset or I'm disappointed or I'm angry. And so we explode because someone or something has blocked my plan, my dream, my goal. For example, you're, you plan on being at work at 9 o'clock in the morning, and so you leave the house, and you get in the car, and you head there, and everything's fine until, bam, you see traffic's at a standstill. And then the frustration begins, the pressure begins, because something, someone is in my way, horn honking, cursing, giving the finger, whatever it is, because I'm not able to get to where I need to be. My plan, my dream, my belief isn't coming to pass, and I'm frustrated. You know, in, in Latin, the word frustration uh, means a deception, to feel like you've been deceived. I had a belief of how things were going to be, and it didn't come to pass. I created this story, this scenario in my mind of someone or something or somehow things would play out. And when it didn't do that, I feel deceived. I thought you were this person, and now I see you're not. I feel deceived. I thought things would happen this way, and they didn't, so I feel deceived. And sometimes those beliefs those dreams, those expectations are verbalized. They're explicit. We say them. I think you are this person. I think you should do these things. We express those beliefs. And sometimes those uh, beliefs are implicit. They're implied. They're internal. We don't say them out loud. And so then we become frustrated when people don't do what we think they should, even though we haven't told them they should do that. Well, he should just know. She should just know. And those frustrations, again, start building up that pressure. Sometimes we have those frustrations towards other people. I believe my daughter should take out the garbage. And then the garbage isn't taken out. And I'm upset. I'm frustrated because I have been deceived. My daughter didn't do what I thought she should do. I voted for a particular candidate. And they were not voted into office. So I feel frustrated because I feel I've been deceived. The election didn't turn out as I believed it should. Sometimes our frustrations are, are turned inwardly at our own selves. I believe that I should have self-control in this new year and have the willpower to lose the weight. And then I break my health plan, I eat the junk food, and then I'm frustrated because I feel I've been deceived. I did not act according to my own beliefs. And I'm frustrated at me. And then sometimes our frustrations are of God. I prayed for the job. I prayed for the healing. 
And I thought, man, it'll come instantly. And then here we are weeks later, months later, still no job, still sick. I'm frustrated because I feel I've been deceived. God didn't do what I believed he should do. And the pressure only builds. And if we're not careful, if we don't calm those frustrations, they cause friction between ourselves and those relationships. Others, myself, and God. And unfortunately, that friction then can end up fragmenting the relationships to the point where I don't want to be around those people anymore. I don't want to be around myself anymore. I have self-hatred and I don't want to be have anything to do with God anymore. I disconnect. Why? Because you didn't act like I believed you should act. You're not who I believed you should be. So I feel deceived and I feel I can't trust you anymore. The frustrations build to the point of friction, which then fragments. And what are we going to do? I know we've been through uh, quarantine and still going through quarantines and COVIDs and uh, r r acting out. We're seeing it in our nation and things aren't happening the way people thought they should. We've seen it through the last year, pressure building. And so what do we do as the people of God, as followers of Jesus Christ? Because if I look at the scripture, the pressure doesn't stop. <laughs> The pressure doesn't end. It keep, continues. Frustrations keep going. So what are we going to do to personally deal with the pressure that builds? What are we going to do to keep our frustrations from becoming friction, which leads to fragments? A good example of this is found in Numbers chapter 20. Moses and Aaron have been leading the children of Israel through the wilderness and many times along the way, they have found where there's no water. They've come to the place where there's, there's a dry spell. And God has shown up. There was a time when the water was bitter and they couldn't drink it. And God tells Moses, cut off a branch and throw it in the water. And when he does, the water's healed and it's pure again and they can drink it. There's another time when they, there's no water and God says, Moses, take a rod and strike the rock. And when you do, water will come out. And sure enough, the water came out in it was enough for all of the people and their animals. We find that same thing happening now in Numbers chapter 20. The people are upset because they've, there's no water. Let's, let's go to Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Then the children of Israel and the whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Verse 2, and there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together, look at this word, against Moses and Aaron. Verse 3, and the people contended, that word contend means they debated or complained or they quarreled with Moses and spoke saying, if only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. <laughs> they are very upset. Verse 40, why have you brought us up? the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here. Notice they're saying, you did this, Moses. We're the assembly, I like that phrase, of the Lord. We're the holy ones. And you've done this. And now we're going to die and our animals are going to die. A little extreme. Here we go, verse 5. And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. What has happened? They are frustrated. We believed what was going to happen. Milk and honey are going to flow. This was going to be a promised land. And here we are, Moses. We're the assembly of the Lord. And you have brought us here to die. We should have died a long time ago. Instead of suffering in this heat, in this barren place. Frustration, pressure building. And now they've unleashed on Moses. They've popped the top and have sprayed all over Moses and Aaron. And now Moses and Aaron have to figure out what are we going to do. And here is how they respond. Look at verse 6. So Moses and Aaron went up from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And they fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. They did the right thing. 
Instead of vomiting back up on the people, instead of lashing back out in anger, they went to see God and waited there. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron. Gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes so it will yield its water. Thus you will bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. God responds and gives instructions. Moses waited until he had instructions on how to act. Now look at what he does in verse 9. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as commanded him. Verse 10, And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, Hear now, <laughs> Hear now, you rebels. This word rebels means you disobedient, you bitter, you unpleasant people. Now you come that we must bring the water for you out of this rock. Moses is unfortunately turning a frustrations back on the people. What's what's caused the change here? He's holding the rod of authority. He's come from God's presence. And instead of being at ease and peace, he's madder than ever. And he looks on the faces of those people. And he unleashes and calls them the bitter, the disobedient. You're the unpleasant ones. Sometimes, unfortunately, we don't wait long enough in God's presence for those emotions to subside. And Moses goes out, and now he feels like God has backed him up. Even though God, if you reread that verse where God speaks, he doesn't say anything about the people. He doesn't say how evil they are or how bitter they were. He just says, here's what you need to do, Moses. Go and speak. Take the rod of authority and go and speak to this rock, and I'll supply. And Moses gets back out, and now he feels like he's got some authority. I'm justified in my anger. And he calls them the rebels, the disobedient. Sometimes we feel justified that it's okay for us to spew. I've seen this happen, unfortunately, lately among people I love. Well, I'm just getting this off my chest. What are you doing? You're popping the top. You're not waiting for, waiting for emotions to subside. You're not waiting to get some answers from God. You're just going to vent and, and spew and fume all over someone else and expect there to be some resolve. You feel better. I'm sure when the I pop that top and that pressure's released, the, the, the bottle is, there's a, 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 a better feel in there. It's not the pressure that's building in there. And you may feel better exploding on other people, but then who's gonna clean up the mess? Who cleans up the mess? I told my wife the other night, I said, it's like when if somebody came up and just vomited all over you. And physically they feel better. But then they turn and walk away and just leave the mess. And I'm watching people express their frustrations. But instead of it helping, it's caused friction. It's causing relationships to fragment. Where people go, I don't want to be around you anymore. I don't want to be in this, this group of people anymore. Why? Because they're constantly allowing themselves to spew their frustrations instead of waiting on the Lord to help resolve the fact. And that's what Moses has done. He's stand up and he's spewing out this stuff. And watch what happens. It says in verse 11, Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with, with his rod. And water came out abundantly and the congregation of the animals drank. Now, what did he do? First, he lifts his hand. He lifts his hand to, uh, why does he do this? Because this is a sign that God himself is justifying this. God himself is supplying the power that is needed. I am a recipient of the divine. And every time we see Moses lift his hands, it happened when the children of Israel went to battle. Moses lifts his hands and there's victory that comes. So the people of, uh, uh, the children of Israel know when Moses lifts his hands, this is an act from God. Moses is saying, I'm acting on behalf of God. You rebels, you bitter, you disobedient, you unpleasant people. And he lifts his hands and then he takes the rod and he strikes the rock twice. This is directly violating what God told him to do. God did not say strike the rock. God said speak to the rock. 
And so he said, I'm here on business from God. And I'm going to strike God. And he, what he's showing is, this is from God. This is what God told me to do. And water comes. Now, God in his grace and his mercy supplied, but Moses was acting disobediently towards God. Why? Because his frustrations were to the point of exploding, and he allows it to happen, and unfortunately, it mars the picture, distorts the picture of God to the people. Understand, Moses is the mediator. He is the go-between between between God and man. He goes before the face of God, and then he comes out and speaks to the people. And when he raises his hand, he's saying, this is God's will. And God himself has told me to do this. When he does that, that is what he is signifying. And God did not say to do that. We are the followers of Jesus Christ. We are his disciples. We're his children. We are. Act according to his word and according to his spirit. And unfortunately, when we act out of frustration, the world goes, is that really Jesus? Because we're to reflect Christ. We're to be the image of God to the world. And we stand up and spew our venom. And we spew our frustrations. The world goes, that's Jesus? That's God? Moses did this to the children of Israel. And here's how God responds to him. Look at verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you should not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. God is upset with Moses and Aaron. It says nothing about God being frustrated with the people, even though they're the ones who started this. They're the ones who said, you brought us here to die. You brought us out of Egypt where there's water to a place where there is no water. We should have died a long time ago. Be better than what we're facing now. And God isn't speaking at all to the people's frustration. He's speaking to Moses and Aaron. Why? Because Moses and Aaron, you are to be the ones who represent me in and among the people. The children of Israel did not know that Moses was supposed to speak to the rock instead of strike it. Why is God upset here? Why do we see he's he's reprimanding Moses and Aaron? It's because in the New Testament, that rock is identified as being a picture, a symbol of Jesus the Christ. Look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, Verse 2, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Paul is saying, hey, this image that we saw in the wilderness is to be Jesus the Christ. It's a picture of him. It's a symbol of who he is. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. This rock, this cornerstone. That was going to be the saving grace for the people of the world. And that it would be rejected. It would be struck. It would have to be sacrificed. But out of it would come salvation. Out of it would flow streams of living water. And so when God tells Moses in Exodus 17, strike it. He is striking as a symbol that this rock, Jesus Christ, would be struck. He would be sacrificed. He would lay his life down for the salvation of the world. But it would only happen once. Salvation came to us through the death of Christ once. We would not have to continue to make a sacrifice. It was to happen once. And now, when God speaks to Moses in Numbers chapter 20, I don't want you to strike it. You already struck it. I want you to speak to it. The first strike was symbolic that Jesus would give his life, and because he would give his life, he was the rock that was struck. Out would flow our salvation. Out would flow that living water that would provide the grace and the mercy that you and I so desperately need to have relationship with God again. And then he says, don't strike it this time. Speak. Why? Because now we don't have to wait for a sacrifice to be made. You and I can come before the Father and we can make our petitions known. I can speak and he hears me. And if he hears me, he answers me. 
I have relationship now. The sacrifice has already been made. And God is upset with Moses because Moses lifted his hand and said, God is signifying this. And he struck it as if to say, no, it will have to be another sacrifice and another sacrifice. And God says, you are marring, distorting the picture of my son in front of these people. You're causing friction now, Moses, that's fragmenting the relationship I have. And so because of it, you and Aaron will not be allowed to lead them into the promised land. You didn't believe me, and now you've caused the children of Israel to not believe me either. Friction has happened because of your frustrations in the moment. You allowed your emotions to erupt, and you distorted the picture of Christ to this people. And God is looking at the church and asking us, followers of Jesus Christ, is your life going to reflect Christ? Or are you going to be like everybody else and allow your emotions and the pressure and the frustrations to erupt so that people don't see the picture of Christ? They see you and they go, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. You're a follower of Jesus and this is how you're going to act every time. Every time the situation gets a little frustrating, you spew out and you get angry and you walk away, you slam doors, you scream, you yell, you cuss, shoot. Everybody else does that. Everybody else does that. And we use this phrase, well, we're not perfect people, but we serve a perfect God. That is absolutely true. And I'm going to tell you, frustrations aren't going to leave just because you come to Jesus Christ, just because you become a follower of God. There will be frustrations. There'll be times you mess it up and you spew. You explode. But my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do in front of the world? Are we just going to keep allowing the mess? Are we just going to keep exploding and letting our emotions take over and our frustrations to get out of control? What are we supposed to do? Because they will come. They're going to continue to build. But you and I have to present an image of Jesus Christ to the world that is true. That he does save. That he is that living water. He is life and life abundantly. And there is peace. And there is joy that comes from the Spirit of God. But when is it going to show? When is it going to show? The best way to deal with frustrations, because it is going to continue to build is what Moses did in the beginning. Moses had the right idea to start with. What do you do with the soda <laughs> that is shaken up? What's the best thing to do? Wait. Wait. Moses went and waited before the Lord. He went and laid in, in the, the tabernacle of God's presence, him and Aaron, until God showed up. And sometimes you need to wait. I don't say ignore. Ignoring and waiting are two different things. Waiting is an anticipation. I go and I wait. I'll do it. I'll go in the car and ride and turn on old hymns and listen to them until my emotions subside. Because that's what I need to do first. I need to wait until I calm down. And then I need to wait there until I get some clarity. See, sometimes, and let me tell you, sometimes your frustrations are not justified. Sometimes they are. People do things you sh they shouldn't do. People act out. Things happen. I get it. Life doesn't go according to plan. Sometimes your frustrations are not merited. There's no reality in them. You're mad at somebody and you don't even know why. You're sitting there frustrated because the traffic's backed up. And what you don't know is someone was involved in a car accident and their life is hanging in the balance. And so you're mad. Meanwhile, they're hanging on for dear life. And you need to get some clarity. You need to wait there for a moment and go, you know what? Think, this, the, I'm, I don't see all the answers right now. I need, I need things to be clear. You're yelling at people and you don't know that they're having a bad day. You're mad at somebody because they don't respond to your text. And you don't know what's happening on the other side. You don't know what they're facing and the trouble and the trauma that they're in. And so you're mad and if you stopped and waited a moment and realized maybe something's going on here. Maybe I don't need to let my anger rise up, my, the pressure rise up. Maybe to calm down and wait because there's something I don't know. I need clarity. I need to wait till I'm calm and I need to wait till things are clear. And then you need to wait for some clearance. 
You need to wait till God says, okay, now here's how you should act. Here's what you need to do. Before you pop the top on your anger, wait. Moses and Aaron waited until God says, now here's what I want. Go speak to the rock. Go show the people that they can call on me and I'll answer them. Wait till you're calm. Wait till it's clear and clarity and get some clearance. Then what happens if I've already popped the top? What happens if things have already exploded? You know what to do. Same thing you'd do if I open this up and it's spewed everywhere. You need to clean it up. Some of you have spewed and exploded on people and they're hurt. You feel better. You walked away. And they're struggling. I, I will say this. Some of us do a better job showing Jesus to the world than showing Jesus to our own family. We do a better job showing Jesus to strangers than we do the people in our own church, in our own small groups. We have a great job being the picture of Christ to others on the outside. And then the people we love we scream at them. We walk away from them. And they're sitting there, the same going, this is Jesus? This is Jesus? If you've made a mess, go clean it up, please. So that your brother doesn't fall. So your sister doesn't stumble. They're hurting. They are, they, they're confused. And God wants you to go clean up the mess. Don't let the frustrations cause the frictions that fragment the relationships. Some of you need to go and apologize. I'm sorry. Maybe what you said was absolutely true. But how you said it was rude, was hurtful. Your tone was discouraging. And it hurt those other people. There are times I have to go and say, you know, I said something. It, it is true, but how I said it was absolutely wrong. And I'm sorry for how I said it. We want to speak the truth. But where's the love that we're supposed to speak the truth in? It's wrapped in the fact that I love you. Moses, when he stood in front of the people and he said, you are the rebels. You're the unpleasant ones. You're the bitter ones. He wasn't wrapping that in love. Was it true? Yeah. They were being unpleasant. It was the truth. It wasn't wrapped in love. He wasn't saying it because I love you. He's saying it because I'm mad at you. I'm frustrated at you. And now I'm going to pop the top. And yes, they received, but Moses was reprimanded. I don't want you and I to have to be reprimanded from God. Because we've allowed our frustrations to cause frictions that fragment relationships. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. And you yourselves must be an example to them. How? By doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Verse 8, teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. You need to be the image of Christ. If you're frustrated today, wait. Wait till you calm. Wait till you have some clarity. Wait till you have clearance from God in how to act. If you've already exploded, go clean up the mess. You've got a brother, a sister in Christ who's struggling. You have family members who don't want anything to do with you because you let your anger explode. You have people who are walking away, friendships, relationships in your workplace because you're allowing your anger to get out of control. We need to be the picture of Christ. The Spirit of God is available. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is available. And just like Moses was to speak to the rock, you and I can speak to God. And say, God, I need help. My frustrations are getting out of My pressure is building, and I need your help. Would you allow the love and the joy and the peace, the fruit of the Spirit, to blossom in my life? Would you give me patience? 
And when you speak to him, what happens? The water comes. Provision comes. He helps. He does help. He's there. We want to present the picture of Christ that is true to the world. That God is gracious and merciful. He is our Savior. And even when mistakes are made, He gives us the grace and the, and the power to go and clean up those messes so that relationships aren't fragmented, they're restored. Let's pray today. Father, I ask you to help us. We're in a high pressurized society. Everyone is on edge, including the followers of Jesus. And our frustrations are building, unfortunately to the point where they're exploding and it's causing a mess. It's causing friction and relationships are becoming fragmented and we need your help, Holy Spirit. How do we present Jesus to this world? And the only way is by acting by Jesus. And the only way we can act like him is because the Spirit of God is at work in our lives. And so we can ask you, Spirit of God, again, help us. Help us. Help us how to deal with frustrations. Help us to know when to wait on the Lord. Because your word says, they that wait upon the Lord, their strength is renewed. The prophet Isaiah declared that and it is true. Then it's true today. If we wait on you, our strength is renewed. We need to wait to calm down. We need to wait for that clarity. Give us the answer and then give us clearance in how to act. And if we've made a mess, if we've made mistakes, if we have vomited on people verbally, emotionally, mentally, show us how to clean it up, make things right, help mend and restore relationships instead of causing friction that fragments. Help us to be a living example of Jesus to this world. Not just to the world, God in our own families, in our own marriages, in our own relationships, in our own friendships, in our churches, God, to each other in our small groups. Help us have the image and present the image of Christ to each other, to show love. Yes, speak the truth. It is important, but God, it's wrapped up in our love for one another. We love you because you first loved us. Now let that love that we've received flow out to those around us and present the image of Christ that they need to see, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We love you for not giving up on us. Even though we've messed up and made mistakes, you're still there. You still bring us back to that loving relationship with you, our Father. And we're grateful for it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I love you so much. Just so you know, you are a champion.